Hello and welcome back. My name is Richard Davis and in this video we're going to break away from the forensics track for a bit and move over to the penetration testing side of information security. With help from my colleague Mike Peterson of nullsec.us, we've put together an introduction to Hashcat that will cover the basic usage of this software. First, if you're not familiar with Hashcat, it's a CPU and GPU based password recovery tool. If we're engaged in red team exercises or are performing a pen test, we could use this software, for example, to crack NT hashes that we dumped from ntds.dit on a domain controller, or perhaps hashes we dumped from LSAS, or maybe an Etsy shadow file we pilfered from a Linux box, or really whatever method that we use to come across the hashes. The software itself is free, and it's cross-platform, supported on Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. The basic usage of Hashcat requires a minimum of four arguments, which we'll take a look at next. The first argument is dash "-m", or dash dash hash dash type, which is fairly self-explanatory. This tells Hashcat the type of hash we're sending to it, and examples could include LM hash, NT hash, which we'll actually be using in the demo, MD4, MD5, the SHA-1 and SHA-2 family of hashes, and dozens and dozens more. In fact, the version of Hashcat we'll be using supports more than 200 different types. In our example though, we're going to use dash M1000, which indicates Windows NT password hashes. If you're not familiar with this particular type of hash, it's basically unsalted MD4 in Unicode, which is obviously an extremely weak algorithm and has been in use in Windows operating systems for many, many years. The next argument is dash A or dash dash attack dash mode. Again, fairly self-explanatory, this tells Hashcat how to crack the passwords. For example, using a dictionary, also known as a word list, a brute force attack, a combinator attack, etc. We'll be using the dash A zero option which indicates a dictionary or word list. The third argument specifies a file containing the hashes that we want to crack, or alternatively, we can actually specify the hash in the argument itself. For our example though, we've created a directory called hashes, and within it, we've placed an ntlm.txt file. And the fourth argument would specify either a dictionary or word list, a mask, or a directory. In our case, we've created a word lists directory, which we'll see in the demo, and within it, we've placed a copy of the Rocky word list. Now, if you're not familiar with Rocky, this was a software development company that back in December of 2009, experienced one of the largest breaches of clear text passwords to date. The associated word list contains more than 14 million unique credentials, so it's often a go-to word list that we use during password cracking activities. So finally, if we put all this together, we've got Hashcat, the first argument of dash M1000, which specifies the type of hash, again, NT hash in this example. The second argument of dash A0, which specifies the attack type. In this case, it is a dictionary or word list attack. The third argument, which specifies the file that contains the hashes we want to crack. And the fourth argument, which specifies the dictionary or word list that we want to use. Now we're going to use Mac OS for the demo but the same options will be used on the Windows or Linux versions of Hashcat, keeping in mind the difference between the forward slashes and backslashes. Obviously in Windows, we would use backslashes in the file paths. So in the next part of this video, we will run the commands specified within our example, and after we've seen how Hashcat works with these basic options, we'll move on to some more advanced options by adding a rule set to the dictionary to create more permutations of possible passwords. We'll then look at brute force techniques, and wrap it up by looking at combinator attacks. So let's move over to the demo next. Okay, so here we are in Mac OS Sierra. I've got a terminal pulled up and I'm inside of the Hashcat directory that I've created for this demo. Within this directory, we've got a hashes directory and a word list directory, just like the slide showed. And within the hashes directory, there's an ntlm.txt file. That file contains the hashes that we want to try to crack. And of course, the word list directory contains the word list that we'll be using for the demo. In this case, we're just worrying about the rocku.txt file. We'll discuss the other ones a bit later. So the first thing we're going to do is run Hashcat with the basic four arguments that we saw on the previous slide. Now, one point of note is that in the slides, it indicated dot forward slash Hashcat. That was assuming that Hashcat was actually inside of the directory in which we were running it. But in this case, I've used brew to install Hashcat. Brew is a free package manager for Mac OS that you can get by going to brew.sh. It adds functionality to the Mac similar to what you would find with yum or apt or pacman on a Linux distro. All you have to do is install it and then type brew install Hashcat 
And when you do that, Hashcat will be installed into user local bin Hashcat. So let's run Hashcat dash M1000 dash A0 hashes in tlm.txt and word lists rocku.txt. Now you'll notice this finishes in just a couple of seconds. If we scroll up to the top of the output, you'll notice that Hashcat has detected the hardware, the CPU and the GPU. In this case, we don't have a dedicated GPU. This is just Intel Iris graphics that are part of the CPU. We're actually running this on a Core i5 3.1 gigahertz Skylake CPU with 16 gigs of RAM. And this is a MacBook Pro 13 inch late 2016. So nothing super powerful but you can see immediately that four of the hashes have fallen. And that's because there were one for one matches between those and the plain text passwords in the Rocky word list. Now, one point of note is that if we run this again, you'll notice that we don't see the hashes in plain text passwords, but instead see an info message that says removed four hashes found in pot file. If you're familiar with John the Ripper, a pot file is basically a file that stores the progress of any cracked hashes. Uh, this speeds up processing, and that's exactly what Hashcat has done. So if we look inside of our user directory under Hashcat, there's a file called hashcat.potfile, and that file contains those hashes. In fact, if we remove that file and ran it again, you would see the output like you did the first time we ran it. Okay, next, let's look at a variation on the same theme. Let's assume that a user decided to use the word airplane as a password, which of course would be a terrible idea. And they decided maybe that they would make it stronger by capitalizing the first letter and adding some random numbers to the end, which of course doesn't do very much to help the strength of that password. So let's say instead of airplane, they make it capital A airplane, and then added a random number like 53 to the end. Well, using the previous examples, Hashcat would have only been able to crack a password if it had found a one-for-one -one match within the Rocky word list that we were specifying. But we can use something called rule sets to apply permutations to each of the values within the word list. So, in other words, airplane 01, airplane 59, whatever the case may be, there would be multiple variations that were tried. So we're going to do exactly that now, and we're going to specify a dash R parameter, and then the path to the rule set. Now, I've copied the path to the clipboard because using brew to install Hashcat, the rules files are actually located in quite a long path, as you can see here. It's user, local, seller, Hashcat, the version, share, doc, Hashcat, rules. Uh, you can find it on your system, of course, by using your favorite utility to find something, preferably find on a Linux box or Mac OS or whatever. But in this case, it is this path, and I will type in the best64.rule file name. Again, we're going to use the same ntlm.txt file, and of course the same Rocky word list. Now when we run this, you're going to see that we actually are able to crack two additional passwords. And I will highlight them right here. Now let's actually look inside using a case insensitive grep. Uh, let's look for thug sweet sweetie 89 inside of the rocky word list now you'll see here that the rocky word list does in fact contain the password thug sweetie 89 but it's a lowercase t and in our case using the best 64 rule set it applied some permutations one of which would be to capitalize the first letter which allowed us to recover this password now as with the other example Let's look at family is important without any numbers at the end. And as you'll see here, it will find family is important in the word list, but the four was not present. So again, adding the permutations allowed it to recover that password as well. So I wanna stop here and use these last two examples to illustrate the reason why unique and randomly generated passwords are important. Now, one of the above passwords that we had looked at previously was 27 characters long, but it was actually a popular lyric, at least so I'm told, from a song called All These Lives by Chris Daughtry. Now, while it may sound like that's a great password because it's really long and maybe you think it's obscure, it in fact isn't because it's pretty common. So the most important thing you can do when creating a strong password is to use something random and of course unique for each credential that you make. In fact, there's a great website called Make Me a Password that can generate readable passphrases. 
I've got an example of here. And of course we can just click through here and iterate through many one, uh, different examples. How do daisies misprint followed by a retail wildcat and a heptagon? So obviously the sponge defends a tent, something like that. These things you can come up with some sort of method to remember them and they're not based on anything common. They're not song lyrics. They're not anything that you would normally find in uh, English conversation. But yet they're long, they're random, they're unique, and they make for good passphrases that one could actually commit to memory if you needed to. All right. So next up, we're going to move into the brute force section of the video and start taking a look at some techniques that we can use to brute force passwords. So let's do that next. Okay, so now we're moving on to brute force techniques with Hashcat. If you'll recall, in our previous examples, we used an attack mode of dash A0, but now we're going to change it to dash A3, which indicates brute force mode. This mode requires a mask rather than a dictionary or a word list. In fact, there's a website I've got pulled up here called unix-ninja.com, and on it there's an article called Exploiting Masks in Hashcat for Fun and Profit. It was written back in June of 2014, but it's still very valid, and it contains a lot of in-depth information about how powerful masks can be and how to create them and use them effectively to brute force passwords in Hashcat. I would highly recommend you take a look at this. As a brief overview though, Brute force mode requires that you tell it what kind of characters you want to use and how long you believe the password is. For example, if we wanted to brute force a password that we had reason to believe was a five digit zip code, we could use question mark D five times with each question mark D representing a single digit. Now question mark L can be used to represent a lowercase letter, question mark U an uppercase, question mark S a special character, and question mark A will represent all character sets. That's uppercase, lowercase, numbers, and special characters. You can also make custom character sets, which were mentioned on the website I just showed you. However, that's beyond the scope of the tutorial. In our next example though, we're going to check for any three character passwords that may have been generated with all character sets, which again is question mark A. So to do this, we'll run hashcat dash M1000 dash A3 this time specifying the same ntlm.txt file in question mark A three times. Now when we run this, you'll see that we are able to recover one additional password, which I've highlighted here, JG capital D. Now, if we wanted to try four characters, we could use question mark A four times, or question mark A five times for five characters, and so on and so forth. But the easier way is to tell Hashcat to increment using dash I by doing this and giving it a mask, Hashcat will start at the first placeholder trying all one character possibilities and then move on to two characters and three characters until it reaches the length of the mask. So if we go back to the previous example, what we can do is add a dash I and actually add two additional A's to represent five characters. This will take about 10 seconds to run. And when we do this, you'll actually see three additional passwords that we're able to recover. So let's give this a few more seconds to run. And here you see a four character password, a second four character password, and finally a five character password. Now we can typically increment up to seven characters in a reasonable amount of time using commodity hardware and a fast hashing algorithm such as MD4 or MD5. Eight characters is possible as well, but will likely be measured in days. Nine characters is possible with specialty hardware, but with my current setup that would take over three years. Now it should be noted that we're using question mark A as a placeholder which tries all the possible character sets. Now let's say that we had a password that we had reason to believe was a 10 digit phone number. Now we could use in this example uh, 10 digits representing only numeric character sets. And on our current hardware that would take about one day, which is manageable. So in the last part of this video, we're going to talk about combinator attacks. So let's go ahead and move over to that section next. All right, before we wrap up this video, I want to show you one last attack mode. Previously, we've used dash A0 and dash A3. This time we're going to use dash A1, which indicates a combinator attack. Now this particular attack mode takes two arguments, which are dictionaries or word lists. For each line in each word list, it's parsed and combined with a line from the second word list 
until all of the possible combinations have been exhausted. So in the example I'm about to show you, I've saved a copy of the 3,000 most common words in English which I've obtained from this website at ef.edu. And I've saved the exact same contents to two different files, top3000-1.txt and top3000-2.txt, both within the word list directory. So let's run hashcat-m1000-a1, still specifying ntlm.txt. For the first word list, we'll specify top3000 underscore 1, and for the second, top3000 underscore 2. You'll notice when we run this that we're able to obtain one additional password that we have not previously seen, which is yesterday darkness. Now if we grep for yesterday darkness in either of these two files, which again are the same, you'll see that we don't have a match, and just to prove that this is the same, no match. However, if we grep for the word yesterday, we'll have a match. And if we grep for the word darkness, we'll have a match. So Hashcat has combined both word lists and enabled us to crack one additional password. So that brings this video to an end. Obviously, this was a very high-level overview of Hashcat. If you're interested in additional videos in Hashcat showing more advanced features, then please let us know in the comments. I'd like to invite you to subscribe. I'd also like to invite you to check out 13cubed.com, which is my website, along with nullsec.us, which is Mike Peterson's website. I definitely want to thank him again for his contribution to this video, and I'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch. We'll see you next time.